well, that would be great. But I'm just going to hand you over to Carol so she can get started. Hello, everyone. Um, I'm really pleased to be here, even though I can't see you. Um, and I realized I was particularly pleased to be doing this for the OU because in my career history, there's a period as an OU tutor. So I've got enormous respect for the commitment that people like you make uh, to your education and, and also the sacrifices that you make. And I, and I know that for many of, them, of you, those sacrifices have been made in order to improve your career or change your career. Um, and you want to get the rewards from the efforts that you've put in. So I think today's session is very, um, very relevant. And you know, particularly as we know we're operating in a climate which is difficult. So this session today is really about helping you both build your resilience so that um, you can strengthen your career management, but it's also about looking at, well, what happens when you know, your resilience gets knocked. So that's the sort of big picture of what we're going to be doing. Um, and just a little bit about me. Um, when I was thinking about it today, I thought, how do I describe myself? And I thought the image of this box might help, because I think what I bring is Certainly, I've got an awful lot of length of working with career issues. Um, I've been working with people on their careers for over 30 years now. Um, and because of that, I find myself now often having worked with people from fairly early in their career when they were seen as young talent up to the point where they become you know, the CEO. Um, and I've also got wits, I think, because not only am I working with people at every career stage and every age, but also I work very broadly across sectors. So some of my work's in public, some of it's in private, some of it's in not-for-profit. So I think there's some wits there. And I'd hope there's some depth in that we know that career issues are always linked to all sorts of other issues. Um, you know, your career sits within your life. So I've pretty much worked on almost anything you can think of that somehow has got importance for somebody's career. So I say that in order to say, you know, please feel free to ask questions as we go through. Um, I'm going to put in a break point about halfway through uh, so we can pick up on things. Um, but today's session really comes out of what I've learned through having worked with many, many people over the years as to what helps people to stay resilient and to ensure that they remain marketable. And so just to give you a sense of what we're going to be doing today, um, we're going to be looking at resilience as having two parts. One is how do you protect yourself so that you're marketable and you're employable? And also the other part, how do you get back and recover quickly and move forward when maybe you've had a setback. And so what I want to share with you is what I've learned from working with successful leaders and people who've had successful careers about what do they do that protect themselves. I want to share with you some of the research on what actually helps people regain resilience when perhaps it goes. Um, and also, I want you to use yourself as experts because you know, you'd be fairly unusual if you'd reached adulthood and you hadn't had to deal with some difficulty. So I'm going to give you a chance to think about what you already know helps you. And as I've said there, I hope we're going to have some interaction and Q&A on the way. And I thought maybe to kick off in terms of interaction, because it would give us a sense of uh, where we are in relationship to this issue of resilience. Um, I've asked Fiona if she would put up a poll of some questions um, that I'd like you to give a sort of immediate response to. So there's three questions there. Uh, are you currently looking for a new role? Yes, no, or unsure. Have you recently had a career setback? Yes or no. And also, how would you describe the job market in your country, and I know we come from a number of countries, 
in relation to you, and I've given you a number of options there. So from there's no difficulty to it's very difficult, and then there's some intervening choices. Yeah, there's some difficulty in the in the market, but I'm not concerned. It's increasingly difficult, and things are getting harder for people like me, and worryingly difficult. Things are hard, and I'm concerned. So what I'd really, what I'd like you to do is to answer those three questions, and then that will just give us a feel of uh, where we are as a group, and maybe will help me when I'm thinking about how to position some of the things I want to say to you. So could everyone answer those three questions now? I think they're working through quite well, actually. We've just they're working through. OK. Finished, so Whilst you're working finish. through, I'll just go on to the next slide. And then when we've got the results, Fiona will put them up for us. So I thought, I don't know if you know this quote. Some of you may have seen the film Invictus, um, which came out a few years ago. And in that film, there's a scene where Nelson Mandela gives to the captain of the South African rugby team this quote, I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. And he gave, he gave uh, Francois this uh, quote because he was wanting to inspire him uh, to lead his team because the Rugby World Cup was being held in South Africa. And he was wanting to inspire him. Um, and the reason that he gave in that quote was because it was a quote that he'd had with him, a poem that he'd had with him when he was in Robben Island, when he was um, incarcerated for 27 years. And I think that quote really links with resilience and when we think of Mandela in two quite important ways. One is that sense of I'm in control, even in the most, in the most difficult of circumstances. And you know, we can probably think that Robben Island is probably the most difficult of circumstances. Even in that situation, I have choices and I can exert some degree of control. And I think that's one of the things that kept Mandela as strong as he was during that time. And there's also a sense of purposefulness about it. You know, I know, I know what I want to achieve. I know what my purpose is. And then I think if we think of Mandela when he came out of, um, out of his imprisonment and how he was able to adapt and move back into society and into a society which had changed enormously in the years that he'd been away. So he had both the resilience to keep going through having a sense of purpose during a very difficult time, but he also had to show the resilience to be able to adapt to a world that he'd had very little contact with and to enter that world without hatred or resentment. And, you know, so I think Mandela probably is a wonderful example to us all of resilience. So I put that there for you as an opener. And I'm looking at our poll and what it's telling me, and you'll be seeing this as well, is a large percentage of people are looking for a new job. Also, uh, 24 out of the 38 online have recently had a career setback, so I'm particularly pleased that you've joined us today. And in general, we're seeing the market as having some difficulty and increasingly difficulty. So there's some concern, some concern, but nobody's only one person's in that very difficult. So, so what we're getting is a sense of we're a group who are looking for change and are having to deal with perhaps something which they may not have invited. So that's really helpful to me, so thank you. And you know that you're in uh, good company from that poll. So let me just, so let me just reinforce what I said at the beginning. I'm going to spend the first part of the session looking at this idea of protection. How do you uh, sort of proof yourself so that you remain marketable. And then I'm going to spend the second part of the session looking at this idea of recovery and moving forward and learning from setback. Um, and I think what I want to say right at the beginning is very often when people talk about resilience, they talk about bounce back. 
Um, and I really don't like that phrase because bounce back means suggests that you know you get knocked down by something and then you just bounce back into exactly the same point. And actually, I think the whole the whole reason for um, getting something from difficulty, some learning from difficulty, is that you move forward. You're changed as a result of it. So bounce back isn't a word I'm going to use, although it's a word that's very commonly used. I'm interested in how you bounce forward. So let me start by talking about what I've learned. And I developed this model around career resilience when I was thinking about all the people I'd worked with over the years who seemed to have careers that were successful, but they weren't successful in that, you know, the no difficulty, seamless, always landed in the right job, always got recognition. That wasn't their story. They had successful careers because they seemed to have a number of skills which I saw equally capable people not always showing. And so I became interested in what are the things that seem to help people to manage their career, manage their career through all the difficulties and the changing context. And I came up with these four sort of zones um, and so what I want to do is, is to talk them through with you and then obviously for you to get the chance as we go through them to reflect on them in the context of you. Okay. So let me kick off with business intelligence. Business intelligence is that ability to not just be working with your head down focused on what's going on in your organization. It's that ability to be looking up, to be always taking a bigger picture view of what's happening, what's happening in your sector, uh, what's happening in society. You know, what, what is it that's coming on, on the horizon which could have implications for your career? And it's almost like um, some of you, you're, many of you have done MBAs, so you may very well be familiar with PESL as a, a model because, you know, every business has a strategy and obviously that strategy is based on its assessment of what's likely to be impacting on it, maybe five years down the line. Um, and what do they need to both hold on to and what do they need to change in the light of that analysis? And I say this humbly because you're MBA graduates, you know, PESL is probably one of the most widely used or certainly one of the earliest scenario planning tools. Um, but I think it's equally useful when you start to think about what does that mean for, for me? Because all of our careers are contextual and all of our careers are shaped by these influences that, that PESL highlights, you know. What changes politically? What might that mean? Clearly the economy, as we're experiencing right now. What social changes? Clearly many of the jobs that some of you are probably doing are linked to technologies that wouldn't have existed a number of years ago. You know, what's the legal, how's the law changing? And how are attitudes around the environment and what, what opportunities might come from that? So I think when we're thinking about our careers, people used to think of them in a very sort of almost mechanistic way that, you know, you got your qualification, you figured out what you were good at, and then you made a choice. Uh, you mapped yourself against your qualities, your skills against that profession, and then you just sort of committed to it and then rose steadily. Well, I think very few of us would would see that now. Now we recognize that careers are clearly very contextual. So if it's contextual, then at one level there are no certainties. But on another level, people with business intelligence think about what do I see coming down the horizon which could have implications. And some of that implications could be about growth. And some of that implications could be about sh shrinkage. So. I'd be really interested in 
uh, any feedback that you want to give me on things that you're seeing impacting right now uh, if you do that scenario planning that could have career implications for people like you. Is anyone willing to um, either pop something into the Q&A or uh, put their hand up and contribute? So let's just get a sense of what are you seeing in the sort of pestle environment that's going to have implications for people like you? And I'm hoping Fiona can lead us through this if, uh, if it's not immediately apparent. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything coming uh, up. We've got Emma who's saying definitely technology advance, technolo technology, I can't talk today. Technology. Technological advances. Yeah. Um, Andrew is saying the drive to do better with less. Yeah, that's clearly uh, a big Christine one. Is saying political issues in the industry. Yeah, so so people are, are obviously recognizing this. And I'm thinking is they're happening all the time. I mean, you know, the jobs, many people are doing roles which have grown out of previous shifts around that. Um, and although it might seem very obvious, I think often when we're in an organization, we become so connected to what they're doing that we sometimes don't take that bigger picture and say what's emerging. Because from what's emerging could come, you know, your next role. And so one of the things I always say to people is, you know, who do you have lunch with? Who do you spend time with? How often do you actually go and do a bit of reconnaissance, which is with people who are outside of, you know, your tribe at work? Because that's where you start to gain the picture. You know, almost like going out and saying, what do you think is going to be developing over the next year? or next few years? Where do you think the interest is going to be? What's going to be shifting? And to be constantly thinking about gathering reconnaissance, because it's out of that business intelligence that sometimes new opportunities, new opportunities arise. I think what follows from that is once we can get a picture of where is the energy flowing, where's the interest flowing, then one of the challenges for us is to say, okay, how's, how's my currency against that? You know, I, is my currency increasing against that sort of analysis? So my, uh, my recent search tells me that the, in June, the strongest currency in the world was the Kuwaiti dinar. So, you know, when you look at what's developing, are you able to say, wow, actually, I think I'm absolutely on track and I'm, I'm a Q80 dinar. Or when you look at that picture, do you get that sort of sh um, challenge of saying, well, actually, as good as you've been, your currency against that emerging picture is declining. Hopefully not to the point where you're a Zimbabwean, Zimbabwean dollar, because uh, when I looked the other day, it told me that one US dollar um, you now need 642 zillion Zimbabwean dollars to, to actually get one US dollar. So I'm sure nobody's in that category. But I think the purpose of thinking about your currency is to say, OK, so what do I need to be investing in? And when I think about people I've worked with who are really successful, then they have that ability to not just look at what's developing, what's going to get more attention, uh, what might be, get less attention, but also how's my currency against that and what might I need to be doing differently? What might I need to be letting go of? Um, even though I'm really good at it, it's not, of, it's not as of such a highly valued um, coin as it was previously. So I think that other thing that I see with uh, successful careerists is they have that ability to take stock of their currency. And I imagine that for some of you, doing your MBA has been part of that analysis and maybe drove you to say, yeah, I'm going to invest in myself. So two things then, business intelligence and currency. The next thing I see in people who are successful in their careers is they really respect their strengths. And what I mean by that is that they know what they're good at and what they're passionate about. And they're able to separate that out from what they're competent at. So 
you know, I imagine that many of us on the line at the moment can drive, um, and so we're competent. But would I see it as a strength in terms of I'm good at it and I'm passionate about it? Well, no. Um, you know, if I was uh, an ice trucker driving uh, along across the frozen lakes of Alaska, then it probably is pretty important that uh, driving's a strength. But for most of us, it isn't. And when I look at people who are successful and seem to be able to sustain their careers, what I see are people who are very clear about what their real strengths are. And that might be separate from what their competence profile from their organization asks of them. But if you say to them, what is it that you're really, really strong at? They will sometimes say things like, you know, you know, I'm a really good crisis manager, or I'm really good at building a team when it's perhaps fallen apart or it's dysfunctional, or I'm great at um, taking things from a blank sheet of paper and building something, creating something, um, or I'm incredibly focused or I can deal with the difficult, uh, or I'm just, a, I'm just great at an analyzing situations. So knowing what your strengths are, it seems to be as a constant that you see in people who, are, who, are, who, who are able, seem to be able to sustain their careers over time. Um, and I know that people sometimes find that hard to say what their strengths are, because they view themselves through the lens of their organization's competency framework. So if you haven't looked at this within your business school programs, then I'd really encourage you um, to look at the work of um, Tim, Tom Rath, um, the Strengths Finder book, uh, which was uh, actually done, from, done by Gallup. Because it's a, has, if you buy the book, it's got a great um, questionnaire that you can then do online. And it gives you a profile of your strengths um, against its database. And its database is of millions. So um, it's a really good way of sort of getting a benchmark and saying, hmm, does that look like me? Do I recognize that person? And how am I using those strengths? Who knows about those strengths? So I think that's one aspect. Um, that I see in people who, uh, who are successful. The other aspect of strengths is, is character strengths. Um, because you're not just a set of, of skills, you're also the qualities and the values um, and the character strengths that you bring with you. Um, you know, qualities like perseverance, uh, qualities like uh, humor, Qualities like the ability to connect, um, or somebody who always looks to uh, bring fairness to the way in which they uh, deal with issues. Um, I was working with somebody recently who is in, who has a job which most people would not want in a million years. Re a really, really tough job and quite high profile. And he said, "I love my job." And I said. Really, most people would look at your job and think, that is the job from hell. And he says, I love my job because it's so difficult that it's really important that somebody with really strong values does it because it needs a good person to do it. Now, there was someone saying, I know what my character strength is. I bring my, my life values and my belief in the importance of treating all people fairly into my work. And because of that, he's successful in what he does. So again, if character strengths is something which perhaps you haven't thought about so much, then I'd really encourage you to um, go online to this site that's on the slide, which is based on the work of Martin Seligman, um, who's a very uh, well-known positive psychologist. And the questionnaire that you can access there, no cost, um, is actually the one which is used by the US Army, amongst many others, because the US Army is working with its troops on resilience. 
And they say key to people being resilient is people being really clear about who they are as a character and what strengths of character they've got that they can bring. So if you're not familiar with it, I'd, I'd encourage you to go online and have a look at the character strength questionnaire. Because again, I see successful people as having clarity around themselves, their performance strengths, but also their character strengths. OK. And then we come on to self-marketing. And I know that many of you will say, oh, I hate that. Uh, because none of us, or few of us, like self-marketing. But I've labeled this slide self-marketing with intelligence because, um, again, people who I think are successful, they do self-market, but they're smart at how they do it. You know, what I've put there is that sort of megaphone, that megaphone self-marketing, where you're just shouting out about I, you know, how good I am. Um, and making grandiose claims. Um, but actually, most of us don't want to make grandiose claims. Most of us want to be noticed uh, by others for the quality of the work we do. We want our work to speak for itself. Um, and then sometimes we notice that doesn't happen. We can do great work, and it doesn't get noticed. So what is it we're not doing? And I think what I've observed is People who are successful do self-market, but they do it through connecting with the other person's need. And what I mean by that is, if I look at how they operate, they spend a lot of time listening to others and getting a sense of what's important to them uh, or what's worrying them. And then they align what they can bring to that other person's concern. It's exactly what I have to do when I'm going to see a new client. So I, do, I don't go in and tell them all about my qualifications or my other clients or my skills. I focus on what's your concern? What do you want to be better at? What are you worried about now? And then from that conversation, I can position myself against that so that they then have a reason for wanting to listen to me. Um, and I've marketed myself without having to do um, a sort of megaphone, a megaphone marketing voice. Because what's the truth is that anybody you go to see, uh, and a potential employer, is scanning you to see if you're the answer to their problem. And actually, you answer that most effectively by really listening to what it is they're wanting. And I imagine some of you in, in your um, have come across this man before, um, Stephen Covey, and his seven habits of highly effective people. And I think his seek first to understand and then to be understood is exactly what successful self-marketers do, intelligent self-marketers. They seek first to understand and then they use themselves to be understood. And people who can do that, in my experience, are far more successful than those who simply just shout their credentials to the world. But you do have to self-market. And you know, one of the things that I, that's become clear to me when I've listened to people talk about themselves is there, are, there is this thing called brand which is how do you position yourself so you get to the right people in the same way as every product wants to get to the right market? And that brand is made of, you know, how strong is your right, how strong is your reputation? And are you known? Are you known by the right people? And it's that reputation reach mix. So for example, if I think about you know, if you're in a very specialist role, and I sometimes I'm working with people in very specialist roles, actually, they need only a small reach. They need a really strong reputation, but their market is so small that they don't go out all the time networking. But what they do is they work constantly to ensure their reputation is strong, but they make sure that 
the right people within that niche know them. And they don't need to scatter gun. They've got, it's just about focus for them. But for others of us, and this is true, I think, of many people I work with, they, may, they, they need a strong reputation, but sometimes they don't give sufficient attention to the reach. You know, they think that because they're known by a certain number of people, that's going to be sufficient, and sometimes it isn't. So, you know, one of the challenges for you is to think about, what's my reputation and reach balance right now? Who might need to know about me and to need to know that I can help them with their problem that maybe doesn't? Am I seeing myself in this sort of narrow brand where maybe I should be broadening it? And conversely, it's actually the reality. My market is quite small, so it's really important I've got strong relationships within that market. So I'm going to – I'm putting this up really as a warning to you that in a couple of minutes I'm going to be moving on to the recovery part. So if there's any burning question that you want to ask before I do that, then um, please flag it up now. Um, because what I'm, I'm about to say is resilience in terms of protection is around those four dimensions that I've outlined there, that business intelligence, assessing the currency of your skills, your self-awareness, and your ability to market yourself with an intelligence that is based on aligning yourself to others' needs. Carol? Um, yeah. Um, sorry, I do actually have a question that's come through for you. Okay, what's the question? Um, from Andrew. It's just asking, in terms of reach, do you have any tips for creating connections? Well, I think in terms of what going wider than, um, Can you just clarify, Andrew, please, if, if that's what you actually mean? I'll just, while he's doing that, actually, I'll just quickly answer um, Anne Marie's question just about whether well, you can have a copy of the slides. We will actually put them on the website. You'll so put them on the website. The okay. End, we will. Towards the end, um, there will be a copy. Um, actually, there's a slide which will give you logging details, but you'll be able to okay. have a copy of the slides from that. Okay. So we'll come back. Yeah. We'll come back to Andrew's question then. Yeah, it's, just waiting it's, for Andrew to reply, so I'll let you carry on. Okay. Um, so we won't, we won't forget that. We'll come back to it. But the, the final part of what I've learned from working with successful career people is they've all had a knock. I don't know of anyone who hasn't had a career setback. And what they've done is that they've used it as a learning opportunity. So let's move into this notion of recovery, and then we'll pick up any other questions. So what do I mean by resilience? Resilience is about, in the face of difficulty, staying flexible, right? Flexible in your thoughts about yourself, in your behaviors, and in your emotions. Um, and that sounds very easy to say, but I think if we think about resilience as the actual roots of the word come from a Latin word which is linked to the idea of flexibility. Um, and plasticity. And so resilience is not that, um, you know, staying stern and rigid in the face of difficulty. Resilience is about how do you retain flexibility in, in the face of difficulty. And, you know, when we're feeling resilient, I think we're very elastic. You know, if you think of elastic bands, one of the most useful things you can have is an elastic band because you can use it for a million different things. My home is full of things uh, that are tied together with elastic bands and uh, all sorts of purposes um, because the postman's always le losing them and dropping them outside the door. So I'm constantly using uh, elastic bands to help me uh, deal with various things around the house. And that's what we do. When we're feeling okay about ourselves, we're, we are elastic. We don't get thrown. You know, if our train doesn't appear in the morning, we don't say, that's the day over, I'm going home. We just reconfigure and find another way of getting there. You know, if something lands on your desk that throws your day awry, you somehow manage to readapt and do it and still do the other things you were supposed to do. So we have this plasticity. But what happens 
when things get tough is it's almost like that elastic band gets stretched to the point of total rigidity. You know that point where you know if you pull that elastic band any further, it's going to break? Yeah, and as we stretch it, it gets narrower and tighter. And that's exactly what happens to us when our resilience starts to go. And I imagine all of us, or all of you, will have had times when you've been more or less resilient. So, you know, if I asked you, what do you notice about yourself when you're feeling resilient? You know, when you're in that place where you, you just seem to be able to adapt. Uh, you don't get thrown by things. You know, what, what do you notice about yourself? And typically, you'll probably find that um, your behavior's got, you're able to move from things to things. You see different options. Uh, you, can, uh, you can change direction when you're feeling resilient. When you're feeling resilient, then your thoughts about yourself are usually um, more kindly or they have a sense of perspective. Yeah? And when we're feeling resilient, typically we have a range of emotions available to us uh, that we can call on. But of course, what happens when we lose resilience is that rigidity, that rigidity that I've spoken about, makes us much narrower. So you may find that your behaviors change, your thoughts that you have about yourself change, and the emotions that you bring to dealing with the situation become much narrower and, and often clearly often negative. So I'm just wondering, you know, as I'm saying this, is anybody, anyone willing to um, flag up anything they notice about themselves when their resilience is uh, getting knocked? Anything they've, that comes to mind for them? I mean, I, I'll, I'll say for myself that I know when my resilience gets knocked, I lose perspective. This thing becomes the most important thing in the world. You know, the fact that I didn't get that contract or they didn't respond to that letter or me email becomes enormously important to me. Um, and the thoughts that I have are often very repetitive. Um, and the thoughts I have about myself are often quite tough, critical thoughts. Um, and I also know... Well, sorry, go um, on. Um, Christian was just saying that um, things like sort of getting short-tempered and yeah. Wild paranoia yeah. about things. Paranoia, you know, we, we, we look at things through a lens that says, you know, it's about me and it's about, um, you know, doing me down or it's deliberate or, yeah, that sort of paranoia. Yeah, absolutely recognize that. What, what other sorts of things? Do people uh, notice? Kim was saying that she loses confidence being able to deal with the situation well yeah. enough. Yeah, Linda confidence. Was saying, um, procrastinating as well, she'll start procrastinating about mm. things. Procrastination is a big one because we don't want to risk, you know, if I get it wrong. So um, procrastination is a, is, is a very noticeable one. That whole making decisions becomes much tougher and confidence, confidence goes. And, then, and therefore, with confidence, um, our willingness to take risks. Um, uh, Alan's also mentioned this is probably very common, actually, as well, just feeling very fatigued mm. um, and also eating more. Also yes. Effects of stress, really. Yeah. And, and the eating more is one of the things we do for ourselves as we think it's going to make us feel better. And it does for that short period of time. You know, there's a comfort, but actually it doesn't help us. It's, it's a, and we all do it. We all reach for, you know, the bottle of wine or the chocolates or, you know, whatever. Um, but they're all ways of trying to cope, um, which we hope will make us feel better and will help us deal with the situation. But at, eventually they don't, that they're just diversions. Um, and I don't know if any, any others of you have noticed this, but often when our resilience goes, our connection with other people diminishes. We don't want people to see us when we're not feeling up and positive about things. So very often social contact um, reduces as well when our resilience gets knocked. 
Is there any other any other things people we want have, to? Um, we've got a couple. I mean, it's on the similar things to what you were just saying, actually, Phil was just saying, sort of reflecting negative thoughts and beliefs to areas outside of where it's so on your home and your family. Yeah. How it has an effect on that. Um, and also, we've got one from the Luca. I hope I pronounced your name correctly. If not, I'm apologising. Um, who's just saying, I get too sad and can't sleep well. So obviously, mm. getting depressed and, and effects from that as well. Yeah. Yeah, all of those things are absolutely, you know, classic things that happen to us when our resilience gets knocked. Um, and, you know, there's been a, a raft of research done on resilience um, over the years, and most of it's been done on studies that relate to children um, and children living in really difficult life circumstances, you know, children living with multiple deprivations or children living in war zones. Um, and uh, the researchers were always curious as to how is it that some of these kids seem to come through? Somehow they don't seem to be scathed by what's happening, and others of them are clearly completely marked by what they've had to deal with. So for about the last 50 years, there's been a raft of, of work done on children, but not a lot of work's been done on resilience in respect of adults, and particularly high-performing adults. So whilst there's a lot that we can learn from looking at the experience of people living in very, very difficult life circumstances, I think there's a lot we can also learn from people who show resilience who are people who we might see as being at the top of their game, which is why I've put up this um, slide, which is based on some work that was done really recently looking at the resilience of Olympians, and particularly gold medal winners, and what is it that makes them more resilient than uh, other athletes who perhaps have similar levels of talent but do not, um, do not get to that you know, ultimate of, of standing on the podium with the gold medal. And in a study that was done, going back, looking at Olympians over the last 30 years, they came up with these qualities that seemed to mark them out that helped them to be resilient. They, they tended to have positive personalities. Uh, they tended to have confidence and innate sort of confidence. Um, they had a very clear focus. Uh, one of the things that they had a lot of when they were going through tough times was support, that they were very actively stayed engaged with people and were able to ask for support when times were tough. Now, that's easier for them because they have coaches, so it's allowed. But uh, that whole point of actually when times are tough, it's when we need to be more connected with people, not less connected with people. And that was one of their findings. But there were two very particular things that uh, marked out the resilience of Olympians. And, and I'm going to share these with you. They, had, they used something that I'm going to call challenge appraisal. I'm going to explain what it is. And also, they used something called meta, metacognition. Now, what that means is, basically, they are good at managing their thoughts. And they do it in two ways. Uh, the first is they don't back off from the issue. So they, if something's going badly, they don't um, blame other people or diminish it or deny it. They say, OK, this is what's happening. This is what I've got to deal with. So that ability to face the issue head on, which could be I'm not good enough right now, um, is something they were able to do rather than looking to find people who would tell them that actually it was OK or it was the other person's fault. And that ability to face issues head on was something that I found when I was looking at successful business leaders who'd had really big setbacks. And they all said in their accounts, you know, people wanted me to feel better, so they would tell me I was great and it shouldn't have happened and all of those things. But actually, the point at which I started to recover and to get back on track was when I actually was able to say, actually, this has happened to me, and maybe I did have some part in it, and I need to move on. 
So there's something about being able to face the issue. And then the other thing about Olympians is that when something bad happens, they, they look at it in terms of, OK, what can I learn from this? So again, not that explaining it away or diminishing it, but saying, this has happened. What is the opportunity for learning that comes from this? Because if I take that opportunity, I'm going to be a better performer. I'm going to be a better athlete. I will be a stronger person. So challenge appraisal. And again, think of that in terms of you. Um, you know, some of our eating and drinking and all those things that we do are about not facing the issue head on. And the other thing that um, our Olympians do is they quite actively manage their thoughts. Um, and I put up that picture of the chimpanzee because uh, the coach of Team GB uh, the psychology coach of Team GB, um, uh, who's written a book recently called The Chimp Paradox, talks about how he works with um, athletes. And he separates out the hu what he calls the human part of your brain, which is the part of you which is analytical, which thinks, which works things out, you know, that adult human part. From the other part, the other, another part of your brain, which he calls your inner chimp, which is that voice inside your head that chatters away at you, particularly when times are tough, and which is driven by emotion. You know, the part that says, um, you're not good enough, it'll never happen, it's not fair, you know, all of those things which, which go through our heads when times are tough. And he worked with his athletes to say, actually, what you need to do is just to start noticing when you're having those thoughts. Just notice them. And, and they're not the truth. They're not the truth. They're just thoughts. And by noticing them, you can start to manage them. And I imagine all of us, I know for me, I have an inner chimp. And being able to recognize, you know, when it's telling me all these things about not good enough and should have done better and it'll never happen and all those things, it's not the truth. It's just a thought. And it's a thought that's coming from the emotional part of my brain. And Olympians either know this, do this stuff instinctively, or they're taught how to do it. And it's such a great skill for getting um, all of us through tough times. So lastly, I'm very aware of, of our time. Um, so I don't want us I don't want just to leave with a sense of this is what this is what I need to do. I want you to leave with a sense of actually I know how to do some of these things because all of you will have had times which are difficult and you've got through those times by having in a sense your own model of um, resources. And so I've put up here uh, you know, when you've been having a tough time in your work or your career, what's got you through? And I've put some suggestions there. Strengths, skills, maybe resources. You know, resources could be books that helped you or a poem that helped you, like Mandela. Um, it could be insights. It could be a realization about yourself and the world that got you through. It could be some strengths that you have, which may be about, you know, I still keep my sense of humor when even when times are tough, or some skills that you have in terms of, um, you know, I, I, even though I didn't have a job, I was able to go and help people do, you know, X. So, you know, if just think for yourself. When you've gone through a tough time, what are the things that you've called on that have helped you get through? So again, if you can just flag those up, and Fiona will share a few of them with us to see what you know to see what you already know about getting yourself through the tough bits. And let's see what sort of things come through. Okay, let's have a look. Uh, Alan's saying, um, oh, I think actually no, I won't ignore that, Alan. But it uh, wasn't actually related to your question. <laughs> and yeah, it coming through. Uh, not yet. I think they're no. all on. Uh, Reluca is saying exercising regularly. Oh, exercise is a good one. Out. Yeah. Yeah. That's a good one. Uh, anything else, anybody? They've gone very shy. In them. They've gone shy. Oh, here we go. Friends and family. Yeah. Walking the dogs. Again, sort of getting fresh air, really. Yeah. Like 
Well, that um, connecting with nature and noticing can be really helpful. Mm. Do, I doing I stuff that, which is just fun, which is completely unconnected to whatever's worrying you. Actually, yeah, as being Mark's actually mentioned charity work, actually. So yeah. That's sort of completely different to what he normally does on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Um, let's get something out of that. Uh, what else we've got? Wendy was saying, I think of Felix Baumgartner, who got his head around jumping from space. Mm. If he can do that, then I'm sure I can sort my own stuff out. Okay. All right. <laughs> that's a very good point. Perspective. <laughs> Perspective's a good one. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Phil uh, was saying sort of support and flexibility of your family. Yeah. Um, Relocations have been a feature, um, look beyond the immediate area. Yeah. And I think it's yeah. really, I mean, it's, given that, you know, people was, uh, quite a number of people were talking about having had a setback recently, I think it's really important to think about what have I got that's going to help me um, be able to move forward from this. I mean, I, and some of those things about actually using our bodies more than we normally do because we're, we're so unconnected to our bodies. Actually reconnecting with our bodies and, and the hormones and things that get released when um, we use our bodies in, in exercise or walking or, um, can be really, really helpful. Or just that thing of you're, you're just focusing. You know, I, I know when my brother got made redundant, cycling was his savior because when he was out, all he was thinking about was you know, the pain in his body, probably. But it really helped him. Um, and I've put up this slide um, because uh, Dr. Chris Johnson, who wrote a book called Find Your Power, he's a GP, um, he talks about um, our sort of template of strengths, skills, resources, and insights as being our SSRI. And for those of you who don't know, SSRI is basically the chemical formula for antidepressants. And what Chris Johnson says is, you know, when we're able to access those things, our strengths, our skills, our, you know, our insights, actually we're giving ourselves uh, our own natural antidepressants, which will help us to recover from whatever has impacted on us. So if you are going through a tough time, I'd really encourage you to think about what you know helps. Um, and to trust that, and particularly things which take you away from the current, worrying about the current difficulty. So we're coming to the end. Oh, gosh, we've only got a couple of minutes. So um, let's, let's pick up on, um, Andrew, you asked a question right at the beginning about um, reaching, extending reach. Did we get any clarification? Yes. Well, yeah. Give me a second. Let me just find his... Um um, that, yes, I think it's more about how do you create reach? How do you create um, reach? Mm. Well, um, it, I mean, create, reach is about connection, isn't it? And, um, you know, either you do it by the six degrees of separation, you know, you think, who, who do you want reach with? And think, who around me could help me facilitate that reach? Because for many of us, the reach part can be, um, you know, can, can be challenging, if, if, particularly if you've got a more introverted personality. It's not something that comes naturally. So using that six degrees of separation of um, saying, who do I know, uh, who might know, that could help me, who could help facilitate that, I think is, a, is often a very common one. Um, I know people who've done it by literally, I mean, social media actually is making reach a lot easier because you know, if you follow someone or an organization, you know, you can now get in touch with them. You can tweet them. You can, you know, that there are all sorts of ways of connecting that weren't there. You know, you can respond to something that someone's put up and start a conversation in a way that wouldn't have been possible. But it's a, you know, but it's about thinking about what is the reach I need and then maybe looking at things like social media to think, how could I extend that? And how do I use people around me to help me to do that? Would be my, my first thoughts. Other questions? Because I'm aware that we've talked a lot about, um, I've talked a lot about the recovery piece and I haven't really allowed you in a great deal. So are there any other? There's nothing at the moment. Nothing at the moment. Um, if I could just, just while we're waiting for those to come through, I'm just going to take back the presenter for a second, um, Carol, just to move on. 
Okay. A little bit. Okay. I'll, I'll so let's... You, I will put you actually back in your slides, don't worry. I'm just going to sort of just while they're waiting for yeah. those questions to come through. Um, just quickly, just to let everybody know, um, there are obviously a couple more webinars until the end of the year. Um, there's one on the 4th of November on positive psychology, um, and then one on the 11th of December, uh, which is on the top tips for written communication, which will follow on um, from a marketing session that the Open University will be doing. So if you are interested in joining those sessions, if you let Janet Barker know, she can let you know when registration is open for those. I will just put you back where you were now. <laughs> okay. Well, don't that worry. I was fun. just going to say, um, okay. just to sort of round off, then, if there aren't any questions coming through, um, is you know what we've been talking about is can you career proof yourself? Um, so we spent half of the session looking at the, what, what I've observed in people who seem to be able to career proof themselves, so that their careers adapt to changing contexts. They have that flexibility. And then the second part I've been talking about, and how do you, how do you move forward from setback? And I, I really like this image of the pearl in the oyster. Um, and that comes from uh, a French psychologist called Boris Cyrulnik, who, again, worked with children um, and uh, children survivors of the Holocaust, so you know the most difficult of situations. And he concluded from his work where he followed people for many years that actually resilience is the pearl that grows from the grit in the oyster. And if you know you couldn't grow the pearl without the grit, um, and that we need some grit in our lives. And our challenge is to use that grit to learn from it, to grow something which is going to make us even more precious and valuable than we were before. So um, I really like that image and thought of resilience as being the pearl that grows from the grit. Um, and uh, I've just put up there my contact details if any of you wanted to follow up. The slides that you're going to have access to, so obviously you know, if you want to pick up on anything that I've said today, then you can contact me via, via the email. So I'll... Um, I'll hand it back over to you, Fiona, shall I, at this point. And thank you for, for being here. And um, although I couldn't see you, um, I felt you. So thank you for being there. <laughs> Actually, Jack was just sort of saying, I think uh, this is quite a, a, a good thing to end on, sort of overcoming setbacks by remembering the way that you actually overcame earlier setbacks yes. probably helps. Yeah, absolutely. Which is really good. So, okay, and Derek says thank you.